Uh, what I want to mention about you, Alexander, Jan Alexander, is that he's one of the most passionate members of our user group. There were not one and two meetings that he would get up uh, uh, in the liquid terminal and catch the train to Sofia very, very early just to come and participate in the user group meeting. So uh, I'm really, really pleased to have him here as a lecturer, and it's a pleasure introducing to you, Jan Alexander. Thank you. Hello there. Hello, everybody. For me, it's a pleasure to be here. So you, you already heard my name. I currently reside in Amsterdam for since two months. I work in this company called the SEO Shop. So basically, we make this platform as a service, which is an e-commerce solution for creating shops. <laughs> So yeah, I'm a PHP developer for the last eight, nine years. It's just like uh, I had a birthday recently, so it's officially not eight, it's nine. And I'm crazy about object-oriented design and everything that is related to structuring object-oriented code and yada, yada, yada. So, clean code. That, that, that's an interesting term that can uh, be seen throughout the day, I mean, uh, can somebody here say that they are writing clean code? Maybe? Uh, not too many people, actually nobody. <laughs> okay, so we can summarize PHP as a dirty language. Can we actually? Can you say how many people can admit before themselves that PHP is a dirty language? Maybe. Yeah, that's what I thought. So yeah, when you see source code like that, you, it, it, it's so dirty that you can put the Brazer logo on the bottom, actually. And I, I send it to teenagers, I don't know. So, uh, uh, code organization, is it a mandatory issue? Do you think that code organization is a requirement for each and every developer? Maybe yes. Yeah, it is definitely a mandatory issue. So I suggest to just like uh, track how we exactly go to the point of having a dirty code base. It's very interesting. We can actually relate our code base with something in our real lives. For example, a room. You can see the tulips, but this is not, this is not my room in Netherlands. <laughs> this was in Velikotern. Anyway, so when you start a project, the Default project structure is pretty much something clean. Everything is so organized, and everything is clear. You can add features, and uh, like you don't, have, you don't have a lot of problems adding the first few features. Everything is clear, but there is something that slips in that doesn't belong. I mean, and after that, it's easy just to clutter up everything with useless stuff. So at the end. It's like, uh, okay, try to bring a woman here. She'll throw an, she'll throw an exception immediately. Like. <laughs> so yeah, this is happening to our source code. Everybody. If somebody uh, would, like, uh, never had that situation with, with dirty code, let's end up. Like, I want to see this. <laughs> so. What do you think is the answer of getting rid of this cluttered room of yours, of the bed, like maybe kitchen, I don't know. So any suggestions how we can, maybe what, what, what is the answer? Yeah, you clean it. I mean, it's not so hard. And when we talk about clean code, yeah, many people can relate to that book, yeah. It is uh, written by this guy who we know, uh, uh, who is also known as Uncle Bob. And actually, like, if you want to take advice from somebody whose nickname uh, sounds like a child molester, okay. <laughs> like, and, uh, but the thing is that I don't want to limit myself in just one book. I mean, while I was reading that book, I was like, hmm, maybe it's not only about formatting and code style. And maybe the, 
I don't know, the, the, the body of the function may be one of the examples in that book. It's like uh, how much code you need to have in a class, or something like that. OK, so I don't think that clean code as a term should be limited just in code formatting, code style, but maybe there is something beyond that point. So this brings us to the first part of the presentation, which I like to call the clean code universe. Because it's not one thing, there are many. And if you are like uh, familiar with the concept of the universe, it's pretty much infinite. So yeah, we can stack up a lot of components and stuff that are going to help us. So it's, I want to start with the refactoring, because this is the process of cleaning your code. Uh, how many people here actually do refactoring? Oh, that, that's nice. And what about 10 years ago? Did you do like refactoring 10 years ago? Oh, that's nice. But on PHP? OK. That's impressive. <laughs> OK, so refactoring. And yeah, it's, 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 it's ignored. Maybe not like social lives of everybody, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of ignored topic from, from many developers. And uh, I want to give an example of a simple refactoring, very simple. If you open a book, whatever it is about refactoring, you, they're probably going to start with this. Like, uh, we have an entity. I'm not putting the setters and getters like I want to be readable here. And we have a class this is, that is doing something with that, ent with that entity. For, for, for instance, we have this uh, class that is updating one of the fields. And we have that stuff over here that is kind of redundant. Yeah, the, 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 the age thing, the, it is an integer, but it has some requirements. It has invariants. And those things um, kind of don't fill up the whole picture of a class that is named the, uh, what was it called? Yeah, <laughs> the guest updater. Yeah, so it has some special requirements. And we can refactor it by putting those requirements in something that it's called a value object. It's a very simple pattern, and we simply introduce a new type of data which contains those invariants and validations. So it's very simple, and we end up with something very clean in our guests of data. But it is not only about refactoring, isn't it? Do you know that guy? Uh, he's a stand-up comedian, very popular. Uh, his name is Louis C.K. So he had that sketch that is, of course, but maybe. So yeah, it was very funny. I'm going to use that style here about uh, refactoring and maybe further in my presentation as well. Yeah, of course that refactoring is a great approach to cleaning up your code. But maybe if you lack knowledge about design patterns, maybe you, you will have a hard time like improving your design in the first place. So a mandatory part of cleaning up your code is to know how exactly to do it with refactoring. <clears throat> yeah, so when we talk about design patterns, <clears throat> it's very important to go through history. So, do you remember that book? How many people own, actually, that book? And how many people own it on Bulgarian language? <laughs> because it was translated, actually, it's one of the few books on uh, that topic that was actually translated. Okay, but, like, when this was published in 1994, like I was born in 1991, I clearly remember that. I, mean, I was maybe three years old. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so, so the patterns there that were suggested 
Like they were grouped in three categories that people can, that developers can rate, like the creational ones, for instance, the singletons, the factories, the structural ones, like strategy, for instance, and the behavioral ones, like observers. I can, at that time, when I look, like if I imagine if I was like conscious, <laughs> because three years old, I mean, uh, I wasn't at that, like, uh, uh, I didn't have much interest in that topic <laughs> back then, I think. So, yeah. Uh, the patterns from that book help people in various ways. Maybe organizing some, some code, and the systems back then were not so, I don't know, I imagine that the, the, the complexity of the systems wasn't so high as, and, and, and uh, so variant as, Best today's. So, yeah, after, after a few years, the need of something more enterprise was, was obvious. So, those sort of set of patterns helped people a lot, but there's this void. There was this void. So, maybe 10 years after that, I'm going to skip a little bit. Like, uh, I'm not saying that other books weren't published or something like that. There is this book that came out. Like, very important milestone. And why is that? Basically, this book provided a solution about enterprise-related or data-related issues. And uh, the patterns inside of it, they are not categorized, but maybe we can try to put them into, into groups. So we have the framework-oriented patterns, such as like even the MVC is included as, as a pattern from that uh, in that book. And we have the object durational mapping patterns. Like half of the book is about frameworks, like page controller, like front controller is also explained in that book. And the other part is about uh, how to build object-oriented map mapper. And you, when you browse a, a couple of projects, maybe, here, for example, they are all somehow based on that book. Like, for instance, uh, how many people use Doctrine? Yeah, so in Doctrine, there is uh, this thing called unit of work. You know about it? It's a very cool pattern. It was defined in that very same book. Not to mention Zen framework, especially one which was like very good academic example of how uh, patterns from patterns of enterprise application architecture were applied. Maybe not like the fastest frameworks, but it was kind of cool. Anyhow, this. The, the P of EEA solved a bunch of problems, maybe an area of problems. But the thing about the patterns from that book is that they solve an area of problems that are like, they may be complex, but they are trivial. I mean, you can just use like a, a framework that has all of those things nowadays, and you, you are left with a void again, and this is, how to express the business requirements of your client or your product, maybe. So yeah, something is missing in the whole picture here. And a year later, a new book came out. And uh, if you were on the tutorial day, I think it was from uh, Sebastian Bergman and uh, Stefan Pripsch, they were having a tutorial about test-driven domains, I guess. So how many people went to that tutorial? Yeah, that's, that's nice. But do you realize that uh, if you haven't heard about domain-driven design before that, your life just changed? Like, yeah. So this is not a book about patterns, actually. So it's, it is actually a discipline about domain-driven design, which is 
technically translated, means that this is how you can handle actual, the, the actual business logic that comes from the client or the business requirements of a product that you're working on. So the, the very basic foundations of, the, like the building blocks of, of the domain driven design is very simple actually. I, I'm going to cut it like a lot because there is no a lot of time to explain all of it. But yeah, you have entities, like if you work with doctrine, we all, you, you, all, you, you already know what the entity is. You have repositories, and this is the way to handle entities. It's very simple. And you have the value objects, which is simply a wrapper for complex, like not very complex, but maybe for, for fields in your tables that have more like complex environments, more complex requirements. We already seen an example about the entity and the value object. So uh, I advise you just to like uh, Google Domain Driven Design, learn more about it, because it is about solving business-related problems. It's very helpful. And some motivation maybe about the Domain Driven Design. OK, first of all, yep. imagine that girls are going to like you. Like you go into the club and you say, like, yeah, no, Domain Driven Design. <laughs> OK, the, so now the second thing is it's real. Java developers are going to respect you. And if you have the respect of Java developers, you simply became the alpha male. Because like a PHP developer that is having the respect of like those gods, Java developers, it's pretty cool, you know. <laughs> so yeah, let's put up summary about what we have learned or we, what we like uh, remembered so far. So we have the domain driven design on that side. Let's say that this site is more close to the user expectations, like the business requirements. We have the enterprise patterns that are actually helping us to build a framework, or if we use an already built one, we don't need them. <laughs> but like many products nowadays do not rely fully on already created frameworks for one or many reasons. And we can like wrap everything in refactoring. And we, if we use the knowledge about like those patterns, we can have a good refactoring. Like uh, we know why we are refactoring, where to use that and this. And we can sprinkle everything with the good old classical design patterns. Okay, so it's not only that. It's not only about patterns. And uh, like usage of knowledge is nothing about it's nothing without some discipline. So yeah, I'm going to introduce you about some very known principles. And how many of you here know the dry principle? Yeah, okay, that's good. I'm not a big fan of the dry principle for one particular reason. It's quite controversial, mainly because. It's like it's, it's understood in a very bad way. Dry means don't repeat yourself. And what do you do? You put everything like in one big, fat class. Uh, how many people did that in order to escape of cold repetition? Yeah, so apparently only I did that. So <laughs> yeah, the first time I learned about the dry principle, this is what I, what what I thought. I just like, uh, just generalize this stuff, like take this method, uh, put it in an abstract class, let, let's extend that class everywhere. So we have, we have to learn from our mistakes and we need to realize that the dry principle is not the only principle out there. So we can add it actually to the clean code universe because the, the, the idea of uh, not having like uh, repeating code, it's, it's, it's actually cool, yeah, if you do it right. So how many people were on the Solid MVC lecture yesterday? Yeah, so you understood the, the, the basics of, of the Solid principles. It was, it was an amazing talk, actually, because uh, like some of those principles are very hard to, to explain, in particular the, 
the, the open closed and the list of there are a little bit difficult to explain. So, yeah, the majority of people here already know about Solid, so I'm going just to put it here in the clean code universe because it's a major part of like persisting our con code, uh, code base clean. And yeah, while I was listening about uh, the solid, something like uh, came into my mind. Like, well, many of those principles may have like lead to over design. So yeah, it's good to follow them, but to be wise with, with the time frame as well. So uh, in a perfect world, nobody is pushing us, but actually we are all always like trying to lead, reach a deadline and yada, yada, yada. On the other hand, uh, you can get losing in the design. So having those two principles like that, you aren't going to need it. And the KISS principle is very useful in some cases to escape over design. So think about it like, while you refactor, are you going actually like, to, to, to gain some benefit of uh, something that seems cool, but actually is uh, over design? OK, so we can put that on the board as well. And our clean code universe like, took some shape. Yeah, but I'm going to repeat again that uh, I'm not limiting only to that. There are a lot of more stuff. Like, yeah, a lot more to read. Yeah, I'm, I'm just presenting in my own experience what I have, uh, like, under the hood. OK, so the second part is it's smaller, it's faster, and it's some practical uh, advices that I want to give in my own, from my own experience. So how many people work with web services? Yeah, how many of those web services are actually a little bit crappy, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I, this problem right, right here with the legacy web services, I like to call the P effect. Like, uh, do you know what P is? Like, not taking a P, I mean. I like, pitched this small green vegetable. And there was a fairy tale about this princess. Uh, and the, the prince simply put like a, a little piece of pee under the sheets, and uh, yeah, that girl was like in the morning, ah, I couldn't sleep or something like that. I mean, and we can relate that fairy tale with web services. Why is that? If we have a cold smell coming from the service, and we don't catch that at the earliest stages of our wrapping, it will take casualties, and basically on every layer of code, we're going to deal with the same uh, problems again and again. So this is one example. For instance, we have very interesting uh, date format, which is not even a timestamp. Actually, do you recognize that date? It's May the 4th. Any Star Wars fans? <laughs> It's made a fourth video. Anyway, so many people actually try to format uh, that date every time they want to display it. So you have uh, hundreds of repetitions in your source code uh, where you actually can end up doing that. A good idea is just to use an already available value object, daytime, which is actually not a perfect uh, example of value object. Like, uh, there is one other class called daytime immutable. Uh, this is typically PHP style thing to have two classes doing the same thing. Anyway, so we can wrap that in a value object. We can create an entity and just push it through. I mean, in the upper layers, just to use that already created and well formatted object. And the upper layers are not going to have any problem with formatting next, next time. So another good example is uh, uh, usage of collections. Like, you know what collections are from Java, maybe. 
So they are very helpful in a lot of ways. But for instance, if we have some data coming for a, from a database, we usually, like in the old styles, we, we get it in some form, typically array, maybe. So if we want something extracted from that array, we can loop it and just get the new data. However, if we use a collection over here, we can get rid of some redundant uh, repetitive logic. So if, for instance, our repository here returns a collection, this collection, we can actually use this method inside of it and sort things out very easily. Last but not least, uh, it's about the usage of exceptions. Uh, you all have, I assume, that many people actually have used this style of uh, uh, reporting some errors or something like that in your code. So you have some function that is doing something, in our case, like in, with, with insurance plan choosing. And we have this strange array that is returning a status code and some message. And I have seen that in the, I have used that, yeah. <laughs> and and why we have exceptions in PHP, why don't you just use it? I mean, you can create a custom exception, and for each case, there are not a lot of, like I, I assume, a lot of cases, but for each case, you can, like, uh, throw exception, catch it somewhere, and uh, forget about everything related with status, uh, or is successful, is valid array members. So yeah, use exceptions. They are, that for, they are there for, for exactly that. Some other small tips that I want to give. Like, first of all, structuring data is essential. It's, it's the first thing that you need to do. Actually, everything goes down to structuring data. If you don't structure your data on time, you're going to have problems. So be wise about structuring data. And don't rely only on, on blog posts, read books. Because I, I remember one blog post. It was uh, like something about object-oriented programming is old, it's not good, or something like that. I actually feel bad about the keyboard of that guy, because it's been through more shit than a toilet. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. So when you when you're dealing with clean code, remember that it's not only a destination, and it's not limited only to the stuff that I presented. It's all about learning every day. Thank you very much. <laughs>